And finally, I'd like to introduce someone who always has the last word. Andy McAfee is co-director of the Initiative on the Digital Economy. He is the yin to Eric Brynjolfsson's yang, as they've done more than any other academic du duo to change the conversation toward a solution space for guiding the technology-driven economy to a place that benefits more people, not far fewer. Andy's been the closing keynote spot in this event for the last six years, and he never fails to impress. This year's commentary is on a tale of two machine ages. Welcome, Andy McAfee. If I'm the yin to Eric's yang, I'm also the medium-sized bald guy that gets mistaken for David all the time. <laughs> um, how many of us have been to the MIT Sloan CIO Symposium before? All right, so we know that this last session, this is one of my favorite sessions every year, because what we do at the end of the CIO Symposium is pull back and focus on some pretty big questions. Can I get my slides, please? like this one. This seems like a fitting topic to end a CIO symposium on. But this is actually, this is a great dinner party question. If you're ever at a dinner party and the conversation stalls, ask this and watch what happens. Give your people about 4,000 years to work with and turn them loose. Because what you'll learn is what kind of people you have at the dinner table. The Philosophy majors will manifest themselves pretty early and often and talk about these new schools of thought and ways of looking at the world in both the East and the West that were transformative. And the folk of a spiritual bent will appear and they'll talk about the foundation of the world's major religions as the deeply important transformative events in human history. You'll get the more truculent people involved to say, actually, what changes the world? What affects people's lives all over the world are the great stories of war and conquest and empire. You'll always get some cheery soul who says, don't forget about the plagues. <laughs> and then the conversation will turn. You'll talk about the great voyages of discovery that opened up the world. You'll talk about advances in technology and science that helped us out so much, or periods when there was a great flourishing of the arts. This conversation will go and go and go. And it feels like there's no resolving it until the geek at the table manifests himself or herself. And what she will say is, well, what does the evidence say? If you're asking a story about what bent the curve of human history, let's draw the curve and see what it looks like. And it turns out, you can actually do this. We have really good data going back thousands of years, thanks to some amazing sleuthing. We have data going back thousands of years on things we care about. How many people were there? What were the rates of economic growth? We have nice measures of how advanced our civilizations were in both the West and the East going back thousands of years. When you do this, when you take this pretty geeky approach to the question, you learn two things right away. First of all, you learn that nothing on this picture so far matters even one little bit. So while all that stuff was going on, while we were founding religions and fighting wars and coming up with zero and all that stuff, humanity ticked on a really boring zero growth, zero progression, just an incredibly slow slog through history. And then you notice that at one point in time, something bent the curve in the blink of an eye, blink, blink, bleh, bent it just about 90 degrees and put us on a completely different trajectory. We're sitting here at a technology conference. The title of this talk is The Second Machine Age. You can probably guess what this was, right? The Industrial Revolution, the set of engineering advances and brilliant tinkering that came around the improved steam engine, kicked humanity into an entirely different gear. It exploded our population around the world. It kicked our economic growth upward into much higher rates. Our, we led longer lives. We led healthier lives. This was an amazing story for humanity. The problem was, though, that this age seemed to bring along with it this, this bottomless hunger, this, this rapacious hunger for resources. So a couple things started to happen as the Industrial Revolution really picked up steam. There were a couple consequences. A lot of the consequences were great for the human condition. Not all of them, and not all of them for the planet. It turns out that the Industrial Revolution needed a lot of wood for things like railroad ties. So we chopped down lots of forests in lots of parts of the world. New England, at one point in time, was completely deforested. We took some of the most uh, majestic creatures on the planet and hunted them damn near to extinction. And we made the moral mistake because the thirst for labor was so great. 
we made the moral mistake of putting kids to work in our factories for a period of time. So it had the, the, the first machine age had this ridiculous thirst for material inputs, for resources. And a lot of people felt like we were going to strip the world and lay our planet to waste to satisfy the demands of the first machine age. This is what gave rise to the environmental movement. And it sounds like a great idea. Just conserve. Just use less stuff. And let's make our machines so much more efficient that they don't need to use as much stuff. This really felt, as felt for a lot of people, like the salvation of the first machine age. There's a problem with this, though. And it was brought up actually in the 19th century by a British economist who was studying what actually happened as the steam engines, as the coal furnaces of Britain became much, much more efficient. And he had kind of a bummer of a conclusion. He wrote a book called The Coal Question. And he said, hey, our problem here is that as these machines get more and more efficient, we just build so many more of them that the net, the total usage of coal continues to only go in one direction in this country, only go up. So you think about that, and this is, this is a profound bummer, right? It just means we're going to continue to use more and more and more stuff, no matter how efficient we get with each individual machine that uses up the stuff. This is a fairly dire view of the world. And the more we learned about it, the more concerned we became about what we were doing over the first machine age. Some of us in this room are old enough to remember a period of, you know, you could really only call it near hysteria in the late 60s, early 1970s, when there were a series of best-selling books and blockbuster movies and documentaries that talked about how, for example, we were going to overrun the planet. We were going to replace forests with little babies, and the population bomb was going to go off. There were hard limits to the kind of growth we could have. And get ready, everybody. This is a 1975 book uh, talking about the famine that's coming. The, explanation, the exclamation point there is my single favorite part of, of this book title. Uh, you know, I don't think I need to stress, none of this happened. This is not how stuff shook out. Things are actually very, very different. When you look around at most of the environmental indicators, most, not all, when you look around at most of the environmental indicators, they're actually getting better instead of worse. And in most countries today, we are facing the graying of the population instead of a ticking time bomb of more and more babies out there. So things worked out very, very differently than we were expecting throughout the first machine age. And it's worth spending a little bit of time on why. There are a couple of parts to the explanation. One is just good old fashioned innovation. Uh, people talk about capitalism as the death of the human condition and the death of our planet. That actually turns out not to be right because the wonder of capitalism is that when something becomes expensive, we start looking around for substitutes for it. So in a sense, you know, thank heaven we hunted the whales almost to extinction because then the oil became very expensive and we had to go looking around for substitutes for it. The substitutes were so much better, we eventually left the whales alone and they're slowly making their way back. It turns out that once railroad ties, wooden ones, become really expensive, we start looking around for substitutes for them and railroad ties these days are made out of concrete. We just don't use wood anymore last forever, incredibly cheap, and we don't need to keep cutting down forests. So there's this relentless process of innovation, which is really what the pessimists and the alarmists were ignoring for a long time. And they just got that part of it wrong. This is really happy news. Um, there's a more recent, and I believe a more profound phenomenon going on, which is the bottomless thirst that we have in the computer age essentially for more and more digital stuff, for more and more gear of all kinds. This is a graph of a total yearly US investment in information technology hardware. And you pretty clearly see a couple bumps there related to the dot-com bubble and the, uh, the, recession, the Great Recession of 2007. But look how big our thirst is for hardware. As of just a little while ago, our thirst for hardware has been surpassed by our thirst for software. So we like the code even more than we like the boxes now. This is happening despite the fact that both the code and the boxes are getting a lot cheaper, thanks to Moore's Law, thanks to the cloud, thanks to free and open source software. The price point per unit of computation has dropped through the floor 
And while that has been going on, in raw terms, we are spending more and more and more money on it. I don't think these graphs are about to level off anytime soon. Our thirst for digital gear is going to remain just about bottomless. The really good news here, this stuff tends not to consume the planet like physical resources do. You know, all the software you want, you're not going to denude the planet. There's an even deeper consequence to this digitization of the economy and, and this, this relentless thirst for computerization that, I, that we have. I want to show you some data that, that continue to amaze me. And they have to do with the phenomenon called, well, let me back up a little bit. We're, we're taking this, this thirst for computation and we're applying it all over the economy. I can't think of a geography. I can't think of an industry that's immune from this phenomenon. The oldest human activity of agriculture is being transformed these days by our ability to essentially seed by seed and plant by plant customize what we do to our crops. It's going to change the way we grow stuff. And we're now building buildings where the first draft of this skyscraper, which is in Shanghai, the first draft did not come from a human team of architects and designers. The very first draft came out of a computer. And it satisfied all the energy requirements, all the wind shear requirements, all the structural requirements. Then what the humans did was essentially iterate and tweak on top of that design. But we're seeing instances where even in relatively very, very complex and relatively creative endeavors, the technology is actually taking the lead and doing the first draft. And we're iterating on top of that. This is a really profound inversion. It's early days, and we're going to see a lot more of it. The net result of all of this is a phenomenon that I've heard called dematerialization. I want to show you a graph of what we did in America throughout the first machine age with some pretty important physical building blocks of the economy. This is the material stuff that you literally build an economy out of year by year. This is how much America used year by year of some important things like aluminum, iron, steel, industrial chemicals, fertilizer, you know, pretty fundamental stuff for an economy. And what you see is this continued thirst for more. Now, the economy was growing a lot quicker than any of these lines were going up. So we were getting more and more efficient year by year at using all of these, but we were still using more of most of these in most non-recession years. The crazy phenomenon, the thing that I'm actually still wrapping my head around, is what's happened since about the turn of the century, which is that in absolute terms, we are using less of these materials. Year by year in the American economy, we are using less water for agriculture, less steel, less copper, less iron, less industrial chemical, uh, less fertilizer. We're just making do with, yes, less. It's not because our economy is smaller than it was in 2000. Our economy is a lot bigger. It's not that all of us have suddenly decided to embrace a Buddhist monk lifestyle and turn our back on material things. Does that apply to anyone in this room? Right? We still like stuff. We still like material abundance and prosperity. We're just achieving it while making less absolute use of stuff throughout the economy. A little while back, some guy had the brilliant idea to try to estimate the total weight of consumption of the United Kingdom's economy over a long period of time. And what he found out, doing a completely independent piece of work, what he found out was that the year of peak stuff was right around 2000 for the United Kingdom. In other words, if you weighed the total consumption of that country, it peaked somewhere around 2000, and we are physically consuming less and less stuff every year since then. I think this is profound, profound news. I don't think it's over yet. When I look around at what we're seeing with additive manufacturing, gener generative design, and machine learning in the cloud, I think this phenomenon is going to accelerate. I think we're going to learn to tread more and more lightly on the planet. Even as there are more and more of us, and even as our desires continue to increase, we're going to do a better job here. Uh, I don't want to end on a completely optimistic note. There are a couple things that we need to have our <laughs> I'm sorry, you want to just go now and walk out whistling and happy about everything? Let's be clear. We have a couple things to really worry about. We are cooking the planet. We need to not be cooking the planet. Uh, I like to dive, and one of the scariest phenomena out there is a lot of the coral reefs might not make it through the century. I think that's just a profound tragedy for the planet. However, Bill Gates has a nice way to talk about what's going on. He says, we desperately need an energy miracle. We might just get one. 
The price of solar, the price of installed solar has dropped by about 50% in the last 18 months. I don't know if this, uh, if this technology cavalry is going to ride to the rescue soon enough. It can't come soon enough, but it is absolutely coming. The other challenge that Eric and I and a bunch of our colleagues have spent some time on is the fact that the middle class is stalling out and getting hollowed out not just in America, but in a lot of countries around the world. I can show you this pretty clearly. Here's a graph of what's been happening to US corporate profits as a percent of the total GDP for the post-war period. And you see that nasty dip during the Great Recession, and then you see a really spectacularly fast and healthy recovery from that. That's what's been happening to profits. The red line here is an indication of how much of total GDP is getting paid out in wages year by year in America. That's a very different trajectory, again, just about since the turn of the century. The reason to be concerned about this, most of us are not professional capitalists. Most of us make our living through our labor. It's becoming more and more clear that that's becoming a bigger challenge for lots of different categories of workers. So some of the work we're doing now at the Initiative on the Digital Economy is what's the right prescription, what are the right policies for an era that looks like this? How do we manage this transition without leaving people behind, without leaving workers behind. Big problem, big challenge, big opportunity. I want to wind up with two quotes and two pictures. This is actually something that Winston Churchill said here on our campus right after the end of World War II, which I absolutely adore, because I think this is so correct. The only way we're going to make things better for each other and for our planet is by the tireless improvement of all of our means of technological production. Uh, I also believe what Freeman Dyson says, that when we look around, that which changes the world, that which changes our lives and our civilizations is technology. And I think all of us technologists should pat ourselves on the back because of this. Two pictures to wind up. Uh, here is a Massachusetts River Valley in the 1880s versus right now. I mentioned that we deforested New England. It is reforested. We can come back over and over. And if you want to end on a high note, here is an unretouched, unphotoshopped picture of whales off the coast of New York City. Thanks very much.